Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. I'd like to begin this morning with a simple question to our men. Do the women in your life ever bring up things in an argument that you have long forgotten? Yeah, mine don't either. Especially since my wife will hear this sermon. I don't need her bringing this up as well. Women have an uncanny ability to remember. Remember the things, particularly the dumb things we do as men. Meanwhile, men can't even remember why we're arguing in the first place. The truth is, though, my wife, Annie, she tries to use her superpower of memory to focus on the good things that I've done, and rather than all the dumb stuff. In fact, I don't even remember a time when she's dug up the past during an argument, and I appreciate her greatly for that. Instead, she regularly reminds me of the good times and the love that I show her daily. Likewise, I try to remind her of my love through the little things that I do for her, like doing the dishes after dinner, preparing the kids' toothbrushes with toothpaste, and fixing her hot tea before bed, and a hundred other things. You may be thinking, they must be in their honeymoon phase. And you'd be right. Hopefully, we always will be as we continue to try to keep our love center stage. It's important for us to keep God's love center stage in our minds as well. As we look at the story of Jesus' last Passover meal with his disciples in John chapters 13 and 14, as well as Luke chapter 22, to apply its truth to our lives, I want to do a little experiment. I want us all to remember a short phrase. God loves the sinner. Let's do a little practice run. Say that with me. God loves the sinner. Now, you're going to have to stay with me throughout this sermon because I'm going to quiz you about, about what we're trying to remember as we go along. Now, what was it? God loves the sinner. Good job so far. To help you, just in case, I'll go ahead and put it on the screen here beside me. Now, let's get into the story. It was almost time for the Passover celebration. And the religious elites were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, but they were afraid of the people. No one would have ever expected one of Jesus' inner circle to turn on him, but that's just what happened. Luke tells us in chapter 22 of his record that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. He went to the religious leaders to discuss how he might betray Jesus, and they were delighted and they agreed to give him money for his betrayal. He consented, and he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them without the crowd being present. Now, what do we need to remember? Right. God loves the sinner. How do we know that? Because Jesus humbly washed Judas' feet. We learned that just this past week giving him the opportunity to repent, though Judas didn't actually take that opportunity. After giving his followers the example of his humble service in John chapter 13 and telling them that they would be blessed if they did the same, Jesus told them he wasn't referring to all of them. He knew the hearts of those he had called, and he knew that G Judas had already betrayed him. Jesus explained that he was telling them this beforehand, that they might know that he was the Son of God. Those who accept the ones that he sends accept him, and those who accept him accept the one who sent him. It's difficult to know just 
at what point in John's narrative that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, but after studying through the various accounts, this may be as good a place as any. But back in Luke chapter 22, Jesus began to explain what was going to happen later that night. He told them how eager he had been to eat the Passover meal with them before he suffered and how he wouldn't eat it again until the true purpose was fulfilled in his death and his kingdom was established in his church. And taking the cup, he gave, he gave thanks and he said in verses 17 and 18, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said in verse 19, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said in verses 20 to 22, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And what was it we are to remember? God loves the sinner. Troubled, Jesus stated clearly in John chapter 13, verse 21, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus' disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing. They stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. And Simon Peter motioned to John, who was reclining next to Jesus, to find out who he was talking about. And leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And in verse 26, Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As Judas took the bread, Satan entered him again. And Jesus told him in verse 27, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one seemed to understand why Jesus said that. Since Judas was in charge of the money, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy something for the festival or to give some money to the poor, but certainly not that he was giving Judas a way out of his sin of betrayal. What do we need to remember? God loves the sinner. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. There's some debate about when Judas left the table. He may have left before Jesus took the bread and juice to institute the Lord's Supper, but it's also very likely, very possible, that he left after the institution itself. The sign of who would betray Jesus may have even been when Jesus handed Judas the bread symbolizing Jesus' body. Thus partaking in an unworthy manner drove Judas deeper into his betrayal as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 29. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. With Judas gone, a dispute arose among the disciples in Luke chapter 22 as to who was the greatest among them. But Jesus taught them not to be like that. 
instead to serve one another. Jesus told them in John chapter 13 that he was soon to be glorified and God glorified in him. He would only be with them a little longer. And where he was going, they would not be able to follow. Then in verses 34 and 35, he said, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Peter wanted to know where Jesus was going without them. And Jesus explained that he couldn't follow now, but he would follow later. And Peter asked why he couldn't come now. He would lay down his very life for Jesus. But Jesus answered him in John chapter 13, verse 38, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Jesus reassured him in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What should we remember? God loves the sinner. At the beginning of John chapter 14, Jesus comforted his disciples, and he said in verses 1 through 4, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas asked how they could possibly know the way when they didn't even know where he was going. And Jesus answered in verses 6 and 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip asked that Jesus just show them the Father. That would be enough. And Jesus explained in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Then he called them to believe in him, or at least the works he was doing. What should we remember? God loves the sinner. Finally, Jesus told them in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Jesus would give his followers his spirit to help them live according to his commands. And then he explained in verse 21, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, asked why Jesus would show himself to them and not to the world. And Jesus replied in John chapter 14, verse 23, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Finally, Jesus concluded in verses 25 and 26, All this I have spoken while still with you. 
But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. What do we need to remember? God loves the sinner. After a few more words, Jesus told his disciples to follow him. And they left to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. When we think of Jesus' final Passover with his disciples, our thoughts usually go to the moment Jesus instituted our remembrance of his death. When we do, it's easy for us to miss all that transpired during that meal. We miss the opportunities that Judas Iscariot was given to repent. The struggle of Jesus' disciples that one of them would betray Jesus. Their argument as to who would be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. The prediction of Peter's denial and Jesus' prayer that his faith would remain. The disciples' confusion about where Jesus was going and Jesus promised to send his spirit to help them live according to his commands. Each of these, as well as our call to remember the cross, is tied to a singular idea. What should we remember? God loves the sinner. God loved Judas Iscariot, not wanting him to betray Jesus. God loved the disciples, not wanting them to be surprised by what was going to happen later that night. God loved them, not wanting their pride to ruin them. God loved Peter, not wanting him to deny Christ and for his faith to fail. God loved the disciples, not wanting them to be lost without him. And God loves us and died for us, not wanting sin to rule our lives. He sent his son to bear our sin and to die in our place that we would live with him. And each week as followers of Christ, we remember Jesus and what he did for us through this Lord's Supper that he instituted. But we shouldn't limit it to just a few moments every Sunday morning. We should remember what Jesus has done for us day to day, praising him that God loves the sinner so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us that we might have eternal life. So my challenge for you this week is to let God's love and Jesus' sacrifice permeate each moment of your week. After all, what should we remember? God loves the sinner. This brings us to a time of communion, a time when we share together with Christ as well as one another as the body of Christ. And as we prepare for this time of the Lord's Supper, as we partake of the bread and the juice that you'll prepare in these moments, Normally, I would read another passage of Scripture, but we've talked so intently about the various aspects of of the Lord's Supper this morning that I'd like to just take a moment of quiet reflection. Quiet reflection as to what Jesus did for us, but also what all transpired throughout that evening. As Judas betrayed Christ, as the the disciples, they struggled with various aspects of the, the evening, as Peter denied what Christ that he even knew Christ. And as we just simply reflect on these things, and then we'll partake.
and we partake of this bread that represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we remember what he has done for us on the cross and just what all he has done for us. And as we partake of this juice that represents his shed blood there on the cross, we remember that it is his shed blood that brings about forgiveness. Forgiveness of our doubts, forgiveness of our the, the many ways that we have denied, that we have betrayed our Lord and Savior. And the confusion that we may have from time to time. And Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ and what it means to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are able to gather here together and be able to share in this time of worship together. We pray that, that you would forgive us of our sins, whatever they may be, and help us to remember each day, each moment, throughout each day, that you love us, the sinner. Father, work in us, that we would grow to maturity in Christ, that we would be more and more like him each day as we strive to live for you. For, Father, we know that your commands bring eternal life. And we thank you. And we thank you for your Son, for through him, we come before you even in this moment. And we pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to the next time, either in person at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in southeast Minnesota, beginning with our Sunday school time at 9.30, followed by our worship time at 10.30 each Sunday morning, or once again right back here online, initially posted on our Facebook page at 11 a.m. each week, each Sunday morning, and reposted on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel as well as our website. If you'd like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find that address at pleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. God bless, and stay well.